I'm not the most devout of believers. In fact, I got excommunicated from the Lutheran Church. Well, it's more accurate to say I got booted from my local parish due to not going enough because I was at college, but details. Having said that though, if the Pope looked like this, you can bet your sweet ass I'd be attending every one of her services, no questions asked. Before going forward, I want to give everyone a spoiler warning. Like Byleth, Edelgard, Dimitri, and possibly Claude, I can't talk about Rhea without spoiling large parts of Three Houses' story. So if you haven't played the game or most of its routes, and don't want things to be ruined, I recommend you click off now. Rhea's a mess. A compelling and surprisingly well put together mess, but a mess all the same. She is, very clearly, one bad day away from completely losing it. A day, mind you, we see in Crimson Flower, Edelgard's route. Those who started with the Black Eagles and sided with Edelgard tend to have a massive hate on for Rhea, much like those who picked Blue Lions when it comes to Edelgard. Initial impressions are a powerful thing and tend to color our perception. This may explain my more neutral, or at the very least, understanding disposition when it comes to the Dragon Pope. I played Golden Deer first. Rhea, like Edelgard, has made and continues to make a lot of mistakes over the course of Three Houses story. She is flawed, incredibly so. However, she isn't all that bad. Now before people jump down my throat for being an apologist, allow me to explain where I'm coming from. First and foremost, Fire Emblem Three Houses is a prime example of the unreliable narrator. For those who don't know, the unreliable narrator is a literary technique where the credibility of the one telling the story is compromised. The information being conveyed to the reader, or in this case, player, isn't necessarily complete or even accurate. Byleth has to wade through an ocean of lies and half-truths to separate fact from fiction. And make no mistake, Byleth is lied to on every route, be it knowingly or unknowingly. I bring this up because most of the accusations raised at Rhea, at least within the plot itself, which I want to talk about first, come from an unreliable narrator, Edelgard. It's awfully convenient that the crimes the ashen-haired empress ascribes to the church not only benefit those who slither in the dark, but also justify the Andrestian Empire's War of Conquest, or reconquest, depending upon your perspective. Conveniently, for my sake, Edelgard outlines said crimes in the speech that preludes her declaration of war. Her first point is that Rhea and the church wish to rule the world. Considering the fact the Church of Saros has stayed within the borders of Fodlan for over a thousand years and hasn't declared any crusades to purge non-believers, demonstrates that this notion is wrong, full stop. Funnily enough, Fodlan is aggressively isolationist, something which is a core idea of Claude's route. Despite constant attacks from Almyra, the church has never called upon the lords of the land to strike back and conquer their rowdy neighbor. To go along with that, other than the kingdom which conquered Duskert in response to the tragedy that those who slither, Edelgard's begrudging allies, orchestrated, the Empire is the only nation that has territory outside of Fodlan in the form of its vassal, Brigid. It's just something I wanted to note, because if Edelgard didn't grant Brigid its independence in Crimson Flower, I'd say this accusation was projection. Now on to the Empress's next point. Rhea and the Church fooled the people. You're not going to get any argument from me on this one. The Dragon Milf is a liar. A liar I can get behind, but a liar all the same. In all seriousness though, this is, in my opinion, Edelgard's strongest point since it isn't built upon lies and half-truths. Having said that though, I can understand where Rhea is coming from. Sothis came from someplace far away, Space. changed her form to resemble humanity, and gave her blood to quote-unquote birth her children. She created an entire race of people and guided Fodlin for lord knows how long. I understand why Rhea would view the sassy lolly as a god. Does this excuse the false teachings of a religion? <laughs> no. Not at all, hence the mostly part of this video's title. However, it provides context. What I said was true from a certain point of view, that sort of thing. Also, Rhea hiding the nature of what she is from the world at large, it just makes sense. Her people were all but wiped out. It isn't hard to understand that she wants to prevent that from happening again. Now, I want to move on. However, I will come back and talk about the nature of the religion when it's relevant, basically at the end of the video. 
onto Edelgard's third, fourth, and fifth points since they bleed into one another. The church divided the empire to create a kingdom, and divided a kingdom to create an alliance. In order to ensure their own power, the church fostered political instability and made the masses bicker amongst themselves. Man, where to begin? First off, Edelgard's interpretation of events is a gross oversimplification that a shocking amount of players I've talked to actually believe. In regards to the kingdom breaking away from the empire, it is true that the church helped negotiate a peace which led to Fargus's independence. However, this was done after four years of sustained conflict. Rhea didn't partition the land on a whim to subvert the empire. The war was already going on branching off of that. Only a few decades after Fargus broke away, the imperial region of Leicester rebelled as well. Though it was quickly conquered by the newly formed kingdom, the fact both of these rebellions happened relatively close to one another shows that the empire was going through a period of political instability. Granted, said instability could have been created by the church, as Edelgard implies, however, Rhea isn't particularly subtle or tactful, as shown with her treatment of the western church. Assuming, of course, these rebellions didn't happen organically due to diverging cultures that emerge over the course of then 7 to 800 years, something which has happened quite often in our world, I suspect those who slither in the dark were the ones who instigated them. Not only do we see the immense political power the grey-skinned bastards leverage during the war in Three Houses, but we see them do precisely what Edelgard accuses the Church of doing with Lord Lenado and the Western Church. Simply put, someone lied to the Western Church and told them that Rhea had to die for the goddess's sake. This lie not only led to events in-game, but also resulted in the death of Lord Lenato's son, something which contributed to his decision to rebel. Since the outcome of this lie only benefited those who slither in the dark and their plans to destabilize Foldland, it's apparent they were the ones who fabricated said lie. Since we're shown in-game, this is how they operate, I'm of the belief those that slither caused the rebellions which divided the continent, their aim being to weaken the church. If the nations of the continent are at each other's throat, the church doesn't have much of an army to call upon if a true threat to its power emerges. United we stand, divided we fall. That sort of thing. To round this section off, the war that founded the Leicester Alliance had nothing to do with the church. After the kingdom was divided among King Klaus's three sons, Gavokan succession is a bitch. The region of Leicester was ruled by one of said sons as an archduke. After his death, however, the lords of Leicester rejected the royal heir and rebelled. This led to a war and the eventual creation of the alliance. Again, unless of course you still have Edelgard's mindset, the church had nothing to do with this conflict. Now on to the sixth point. The church has amassed gold and lived in extravagance by exploiting the goddess's salvation. I'll be blunt, I don't see this as accurate. It makes perfect sense considering what the religious institutions of the Middle Ages and beyond were like, however, I can't think of an instance in game where we're shown this for ourselves. Not going to go any deeper than that, since I'd just be speculating without any evidence. Unless I'm blanking completely, I believe this is the first and only time this topic is brought up, something I just wanted to mention. Moving on to Edelgard's seventh point. The church are foul hypocrites that cannot lead Fodlin to true peace. As I stated before, with the exception of foreign invasions, I'm all but certain the ones who instigate the continent's internal wars are those who slither in the dark, making the accusation that the church is hypocritical during the midst of a declaration of war rather… rich. Having said that though, Fodlin has had almost 700 years of uninterrupted peace, as well as several centuries virtually free of war. When it comes to quote-unquote true peace, it's really hard to argue with Rhea's results. Admittedly, this achievement is built upon a pretty massive lie, but I'll touch on that in a bit. We're almost there. Finally, it's time for Edelgard's eighth point, something which, like in the game itself, has sparked countless debates. The importance of crests and the system of hereditary succession must be torn asunder so that true wisdom can prevail. You know what's an awful and oppressive form of government? Feudalism. There's a reason why it's been mostly abandoned and replaced by more democratic systems, be it democracies or republics all across the world. You know what's another awful and oppressive form of government? An imperial dictatorship. This is something most supporters of Edelgard seem to miss. 
She isn't attempting to institute a form of government that answers to the will of the people. She's simply trying to get rid of hereditary succession and replace it with a system of meritorious appointment. At least, that's what I've gathered from her admittedly vague as hell plan. Addressing this, honestly, deserves its own video because in theory, this sounds like a step in the right direction. In practice, however, well, let's just say there's a host of issues, all of which I just can't address here. The big thing I want to focus on, however, is the subjective nature of the quality being measured, merit, as well as the fragility of succession that pops up under Edelgard's system. Remember, she isn't proposing a government that elects, but appoints. When something like that fails, it fails hard. Unlike Rhea, who is virtually immortal, Edelgard has no way of guaranteeing the system she created will function as intended five years after her death, let alone a thousand. She can't oversee it indefinitely and keep it on track if problems begin to emerge. Basically, the idea of people being appointed to positions of power based off of merit is a good one, but what prevents that from changing in the future? Same holds true for Imperial Succession. Though it's no longer a hereditary title, what's preventing it from averting back into one, possibly through civil war between power-hungry generals? The Roman Empire collapsed for a lot of reasons, however political instability played a major role. Political instability which Edelgard's system invites, especially after her death. For all of its faults, this is the one thing Rhea's crest-centric feudalism has done well. It granted Fodland stability and allowed the continent to flourish over the span of almost 1100 years of mostly uninterrupted peace. The system has problems, it's feudalism. However, it's hard to argue with Rhea's results. Results which, I'd argue, only exist because Rhea was able to oversee and influence the continent for a millennia when things started going wrong, something Edelgard just can't do. Now, the obsession with crests among Fodlin's nobility is rather hard to talk about. Clearly, importance is placed upon them, though to varying degrees depending upon where you are. House Gautier, for example, disinherited their firstborn because he didn't have a crest, and they really need one to defend their lands. However, not every noble family does this, as seen with another kingdom lord, Baron Dominique, Annette's uncle. I bring this up because it appears the nobility unto itself is trying to keep crests around, for one reason or another, as opposed to Rhea herself. She isn't forcing or enforcing the crest system outright, though she is admittedly encouraging it, which is one of the big things we have to talk about. The entire basis behind the Church of Saros belief system is that of a lie. As the story goes, when Fodlin was attacked by wicked gods, Sothis granted Nemesis the Sword of the Creator, which he used to defeat the beings that threatened his home. In turn, he was granted the name the King of Liberation and became a hero without peer. Over time, however, Nemesis was corrupted and waged war upon the goddess. This led to the War of Heroes, where the Ten Elites fought beside Seros and the Four Saints, resulting in the death of Nemesis. Unless the player is still being lied to, when Rhea comes clean during Golden Deer and Church Route, Nemesis and the Ten Elites, which sided with him, were nothing more than brigands, pawns of those who slither in the dark, that killed the children of Xanado and Sothis, turned their remains into weapons to form the relic, and consume their blood to develop crests. I understand the reasoning behind this lie, to cover up a terrible truth that could destabilize Fodlin and see a never-ending series of wars, something which is averted. The issue, however, an issue which is why there's a mostly in the video's title, is how disastrously this ultimately turns out, that being the war in three houses. If Rhea kept the belief system of her church closer to reality, and then structured society around that, then those who slither in the dark wouldn't have much, if anything, to manipulate Edelgard with. Rhea took a completely unnecessary and amoral risk that cost the lives of a lot of innocent people. The offspring of the Ten Elites didn't have to become the basis for Fodlin's nobility. Rhea could have set something else up, let crests and relics fade into time. Yet she didn't. This begs the question, why? I get that crests and relics are powerful, and that the Sword of the Creator did some crazy nonsense in the past, so Rhea would want to keep them around. However, the nature of her lie, and the massive risk that comes with it, the fate of the entire continent, makes me believe there is another reason for why she did what she did. Simply put, Rhea can't let go. 
This leads into Rhea's other big crime, which puts the mostly in Rhea did mostly nothing wrong. Her mission to resurrect Sophus is nothing short of fucked, no matter how you look at it. At best, she's an obsessive, heartbroken woman who wants to see her mother again. At worst, she's a maniac who's done human experimentation with the intent to sacrifice. Violet's mom and the nature of the experiments that predated her are an enigma. We as players have no idea what Rhea did exactly, so delving into that would be a fruitless endeavor. However, we know the Dragon Pope hoped for the power of the Progenitor God to become one with Byleth. The exact meaning of this is the worrying bit. Either A, Rhea wished to see Sothis be reborn in spirit, essentially passing the torch to Byleth. Or B, Rhea hoped that Sothis would completely dominate Byleth's personality, effectively treating him like a human sacrifice, thus seeing the rebirth of her mother at the cost of the player character. Church Route and Golden Deer make it appear as if Rhea was going for option A. Crimson Flower, on the other hand, leans toward option B. Honestly, I don't know which one is the truth. Crimson Flower could be showing the player who Rhea really is, or it could be showing off how broken she has become in the wake of what she perceives as Byleth's betrayal. For one reason or another, the entire situation is messed up, and I'd be dishonest if I didn't mention it. For the astute among you, you may have noticed how I didn't bring up anything that happens in the war phase, especially Rhea burning down Ferdiad. The reasoning behind this is I wanted to focus on the crimes which led to the war in the first place, since that's where the majority of discussion is. You'll get no argument from me. In Crimson Flower, the Dragon Milf is stark, raving, mad, and does a lot, and I mean a lot, wrong. However, it wasn't actions like that which led to Edelgard declaring war, but rather the ones I've gone on at length discussing. Rhea is the very embodiment of the idea that a good act doesn't wash out the bad, nor a bad act the good. Her personal trauma and everything associated with Sothis and those lost at Xanado led to Rhea making a lot of pretty massive and amoral mistakes which blew up in her face. However, her mistakes don't erase all those she's helped, or what she's achieved. A lot of the crimes ascribed to Rhea by Edelgard and those that agree with the Ashen-Haired Empress, if they aren't outright false, are missing a lot of critical information or context, and are often kinda tone-deaf. They don't realize Edelgard is walking the same path as Rhea, just from a different direction. The systems both women wish to see govern Fodlin are built off of lies, and stem from personal trauma. They'll do whatever it takes to see their will made reality, even if it means trampling upon the lives of others. Rhea isn't as bad as she's made out to be. However, despite her moniker, she is no saint either. If anything, Rhea fell into the same trap as a lot of other Three Houses characters. She couldn't let go of the past. But with that said guys, I've been Bufar one on one I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think down in the comments down below. I'll see all you guys next time. Goodbye.